bricklayers. You're in for a special treat. Um, how was that? Any good? That was pre pretty good. Yeah. Okay. You know, I did an interview many years ago for Fingerstyle Guitar Magazine, and the, right. the editor calls me up and he says, so um, I guess you're one of those guitar guys. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's not a bad thing to be. It was kind of, kind of fit. Yeah, you know? yeah well, I, I'd say more than one of, but certainly, yes, you're a guitar guy. I think mean, there's uh, a lot of guitar guys out there, you know. <laughs> well, there are, but there are very few. And, and, girl, and girls, too. I mean, oh, yeah. well, the number of women that have really uh, become professional guitar players in the last couple of decades. Yeah, and that's really great, actually. But, but on the other hand, uh, I have five fingers. Oh, sorry. Um, so what I really want to do is just do a quick introduction for the for the uh, people who are listening. I mean, they probably all know about you, but I just want to tell them that I first met you uh, in 1975 when I left the Berklee College of Music and that I actually was introduced to you by David Barnes of Essex Music. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so he said, well, you know, you're you, you want to meet some of the hip jazz players in this town and him some of the hip studio players and there's this you're a guitar player but you got to meet this guy Lawrence he's this young kid and he's amazing and he can do anything and you know David Barnes was right uh the thing was when I first met you one of the things that just amazed me was that you could do everything well and it, it was annoying but it was great <laughs> well I, I was good at faking it well, but but you know, isn't that what still am, that, isn't that what most careers are about? You know, yeah. and and it's it's interesting that you say that because uh, we think we tend to think when we're coming up and probably think it now that we're faking it and we're fooling people and that the real guys are the real guys. You know, Wes Montgomery and the mm -hmm. but but what amazes me is how many musicians who we just worship are in completely insecure and they think oh, they're totally. faking it too. Yeah. Totally. I, I learned an interesting lesson when I started composing and I was actually hiring players, you know, session players that I worked with on a regular basis. Right. And realizing that nobody gets it exactly right the first time. No. Or 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 any time but it's just even if you get it right, uh I mean I remember uh, uh when I was talking to Matheny about uh, his his process, and he said, people don't realize how much I just have to practice. He hmm. said, you know, if, if I if I'm playing guitar for my kids' school, playing nursery rhymes for the kids to sing along, I have to practice at least two hours just to do that, <laughs> which is amazing, you know. And he said he said it's just if I don't he said if I don't play for a day, I feel like I've never played before, and it takes me three days to make up. So, you know, everybody's like that. And, and um, it's an interesting thing that people don't, you know, the general public don't realize how much work goes into that thing that you're is sitting there on your lap. Yeah, um, no, it's a lot of work. There's no yeah. question about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things I want to talk to you today about specifically is not your fantastic career and all the billions of sessions that you've done for all the famous artists that you've worked with and touring the world with Paul McCartney, that's kind of irrelevant to me today. Because what I want to talk about is the fact that you can play literally anything in any style from classical to, to rock to electric to, to lute, which, you know, when you first met me, you told me about the lute and that freaked me out. But except flamenco. I took a flamenco lesson once and I, I, I could not figure out where one was. Ah, yes. You know, because it's all about the dance with flamenco. I, yes. And I the compass that. is just like, but where's one? <laughs> yeah. I think flamenco is a whole ser section of study on its own for it really that is. reason alone. Yeah. Yeah. Although but I it, love the fact that, the, you know, this the so called Andalusian cadence that, yes. that when you turn it around, and instead of thinking of it in A minor, it's in E. Yes, E Phrygian or something. Animal. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, what I want to ask you about, though, today, 
because my class, my my uh, interviews have always been something of a master class. Because a lot of my shows, I said, "What is melody? What is improvisation? What is you know?" I try to get people to talk about that. But for you, I want to talk about this incredibly unique thing that you do with acoustic guitar, and and uh, I'd like you to explain that to people how you do it. But before you do that, I'd love you to tell why you do it. In other words, what inspired you? What was the first thing that made you think, hey, this thing is pretty cool. I want to do more of this. What was the thing that turned you on to that dad gad thing? Well, you know, I was pretty much exclusively standard tuning, you know, occasionally open G for slide or something like that. But it was really, it was just, I started to get nagged. It's like various people in record companies that or distributors, promotions saying, you know, you know so much about standard tuning, you're so comfortable there, why don't you try something different just to expand your horizons? And I, I remember sitting in a hotel room in, in Portland, Oregon, and this would have been about 1992 maybe, um, and just, okay, let's see what Dagad does. You know, and I and so I I tuned the guitar to Dagad. Let me grab it. Yeah, get 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 that one. Yes, there we go. This one's in Dagad. That's so a, that's you know, a Lord model guitar, by the way. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's that too. Yeah, uh, part of so D A D G A D, and it's like, okay, <clears throat> but where are my notes? You know, I mean, that was the the first thought was okay. Well, you know, this, the top string is no longer an E. Now it's a D. And okay, so now an E is here. So everything is, you know, all the, the, the meta information, as it were, is two frets higher on the, the first string, the second string, and the sixth string. And then I looked at it and said, okay, well, there's now, I've got three D strings. I have two A strings and a G string. And what does that let me do? How do I find the familiar in this new terrain? this new guitaristic terrain. And, and so first thing I did was just started noodling, which became a tune called Bob's Your Uncle. Yeah. And it was like, okay, so here's, here's neutral, you know, here's D major. But immediately what the first thought is, okay, I'm not playing inside the boxes. I'm not playing familiar chord shapes. So where are the notes? You know, where are my thirds? Where are my fifths? Where are my sixths? All that. And then it just kind of evolved from there. And the first few years, it was just me writing original tunes. Right. Mostly in D, but not exclusively. Right. And then within a few years, I really started to kind of explore what you could do in Dagad outside of you know, the key of D. But even in D, I mean... D minor, you know, and you hit a, a G minor seven, but you can put the C in there too, because you have two adjacent scale tones. And, and that's one of the things which I love about the way that you uh, arrange the stuff is that you don't just try to find the familiar of how do I get a voicing in this new tuning, but you go with the new voicings available to you. There's a whole world available to you that we can't do on standard tuning. That's exactly well, that's and, my motto. <laughs> and I love it. I love it when you do that because you're just going for that and it creates a completely new sound. Yeah, you can't do that in standard tuning. Exactly. You know, I mean, think about a stacked C9 chord. You know, in, in Dagad, root, third, fifth, minus seven, nine, which means you have that flexibility you can you can run it up and down the neck in standard tuning you'd have to finger it like this yeah and it hurts like hell yeah exactly and and then you know it's like you wouldn't have any calluses left after sliding around on that unless of course you're on a, a, a gibson birdland and you have like tal Falo length fingers you know maybe then but but you know i don't exactly have the longest fingers biggest hands oh. But, no, that's interesting. but I but I have learned over the years how to have a good reach, you know. Yes, you certainly have. The tip, tip there is don't reach up, reach back. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah. That's your first tip, Pop Pickers. First tip of the day, yeah. But, but the fact is, with Dagad, you know, it's, I mean, it's kind of has its roots in Davy Graham, really, you know, thinking about it as a modal 
tuning for jamming with Moroccan musicians. So. Yeah. You know, which then leads you to Jimmy Page. You know, which, and Al Stewart is in the mix somewhere there because Jimmy Page learned some dad gad tricks from Al Stewart. Ah. Mistakenly thought that Bert Yanch played Blackwater side or Black Mountain side, whichever the yeah. time was, um, in, in dad gad, but actually Bert was in drop D. But, you know, but, but what I did was I just started really exploring this as a compositional tool and as an arranging tool. Right. Especially when I started to get into writing, uh, arranging Beatles songs. Right. Well, uh, first, why don't you uh, give us a, a blast of anything you like, but that sh sort of showed uh, your kind of initial approach to to using the dad gad thing, and then maybe show one of your unbelievably hip arrangements of Beatles songs. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the first dad gad tunes I wrote, uh, "Pass the Buck." on from there but but right. that really, really what i was trying to do was just write a kind of a backwards dad gad angie because mm -hmm. right. in angie you got the descending line here it's just an exactly. asset yeah one thing that i want to uh, bring up here is it's quite interesting for guitar players who might be watching the first thing that i notice is you have a fantastic classical technique and you played lute you learned lute so therefore, I did learn lute, but it was only so I could get like bonus uh, grades in, in college, really. Yeah, of course, that's why. And I'm... also because the music itself was interesting to me. Yes, yes, and it, it was beautiful. But what I'm asking is, your right hand is ridiculous. So you have a right hand which is more advanced and sophisticated than the av your average guitar playing guy that you talked about at the beginning of the show so Maybe, that obviously but, helps you a lot with this but i but i'm not a technician i never was a technician and you know i, I can't you know compete technically with players like scott tennant for example i mean you know the the pumping nylon kind of approach it's just right. not where i live for me a technique has always been about how do i make music exactly so, you know, my, my attitude has always been, you know, the guitar as a musical instrument. The fact that when I was maybe seven or eight years old, the piano that was in my grandmother's parlor suddenly disappeared. They sold it ah. to my chagrin because I would sit there and kind of start picking out things. Uh -huh. And then, then, of course, you know, the shadows come along and, and, right. and, the, and the Beatles and the guitar is just a cool thing. And I, you know, I got one for my 11th birthday and fell in love with it. But but it was always for me it was about how do I make music on this? How do I make it Indeed. a satisfying musical and guitaristic experience? Yes, and but I, you know, and I 
I see that and that's very obvious in, in everything that you play. However, I do want to say, to be quite honest, even though you're being modest, you do have a lot more technique than the average, for instance, even studio guitarist who walks in. You know, if, if I were to hire somebody in LA to walk in, I seriously doubt whether they would be able to do well, I hope that you'd hire me. <laughs> well, exactly. I rest my case. <laughs> well, well, I, I have hired you a lot in the past, so that's, yeah, that, yeah. That, I think that counts. Um, what I'd love you to now show is your amazing arranging talent with mm -hmm. any of the Beatles tunes that you you've done, because they're just it's just a wonderful thing to hear those tunes in a new way, and I think that's you're one of the few people who has without doing what I do, which is just take it to, to Mars. Uh, you know, because I've, I've done a lot of arrangements for, for uh, Beatles songs, but but yeah. but you do it in a way which is so, so much uh, respectful of the tune, but at the same time showing it from a different light. So if you just want to whip anything on us that you want. Well, you let me give you a couple of examples. Um, here's one, I mean, you take Blackbird. Now, I would like to take Blackbird. And, you know, because, you know, the Blackbird accompaniment, Paul's accompaniment, really came from the Bach Beret. You know, he got the idea of these moving tenths from that. Of course, it came via Chet Atkins. Because Chet had recorded that, and then George owned Chet's album, Hi-Fi and Focus, which had that recording. And, 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 and Paul and George didn't quite learn it right, but they, you know, they got, Paul got the idea of this moving thing. But the thing about it is that's an accompaniment. So, you know, Blackbird singing in the dead of night. There's no easy way of playing that accompaniment and incorporating the melody. So when I was arranging it, my thought was, okay, well, let's see what happens in Dagat. And you know, Dagat in G is really useful, but but it didn't it didn't really give me the melody sitting in the right place. Whereas in A, together like that. Now, there's another layer to this in terms of the kind of the emotional counterpoint, as it were, that I used to play that tune with Kenny Rankin, you know, and Kenny Rankin you know, was born with a French horn in his throat. I mean, there's just this incredible horn-like quality. So rather than trying to do a, a Beatle, a purely Beatlesque version, I'm really kind of thinking in other areas to give it a little slightly different angle. Um, but, a, but a really crucial one for me, well, is, here's another, another example of, I saw her standing there, and this is, you know, the way that Dagad works, is that because in Dagad, if you're in D, the fifth is on an open string. So the bass line is, gives you open strings. So you know, and plus the melody is on open strings. Now you could probably do it in E, but your fifth is still you know, your B is on the second fret there. How do you get that bass line to really move right? Um, but the real challenge was doing Strawberry Fields Forever. Because, the, you know, I, and I don't always try and do the record, do it in the original record key, because it doesn't always lend itself guitaristically. You know, um, whereas with Strawberry Fields, the original record key is in the cracks, because the version in A was sped up and the version in B flat was slowed down. And then they were edited at like one minute and three seconds or something. There's, you know, you can hear the edit. Um, so, you know, I tried it in standard tuning in A, in B flat. And of course, B flat, you know, is a jazz key. You know, we're kind of, you know, when you're playing in, you know, with horn players, you're kind of used to being in flat keys. But, but it's not really a purely guitaristic 
key. And it, neither, neither of them worked. And then I tried it in Dagad in A, and that still didn't work. But when I realized that the E flat major seven sits right there. And then because, again, because you've got the second between the third and second string, just to go land on that B flat at two, like that. And so then, the F minor walks down to the D bass, to the G7 flat nine. And again, you've got adjacent scale tones on adjacent strings. Um, the only thing that gets tricky is the Swabandel, like the zither thing, that, which is at the 13th fret, which is why I use a counterway, is to get that kind of move. Because the reality is that 12 fret guitars actually sound a bit fuller, but, but 14 frets to the body kind of became the standard thing, and having a cutaway just gives me the, the access. But there's an example of Dagat at work that you really can't do that in standard tuning. No, no and, and, and that's, that's the kind of magic that I think you do with it that other people don't do, because with all the background that you have in not only the classical, but but the the the, uh, the lute and all of that stuff. It's sort of sitting there in your residual consciousness, and I think that it comes to mind that there there are options that are open to Lawrence Juber that would not be open to Joe Bloggs because you'll think back to a reference point. Of course, I'm, I'm I, I am going to talk about your your classical album, which I absolutely adore. That I want you to talk about at some point, but that's. That's the sort of thing that I think is in the background of your consciousness that it, that feeds all this. Well, and, and you you mentioned that I mean the Touchstones album, which you know is a historical you know it, it actually goes with a, a folio, a Hal Leonard folio called the Evolution of Fingerstyle Guitar. Mm, mm. And you know you go back to mm. the original um, Renaissance guitar, where I mean, if you stick a, a capo on the fifth fret. Hang on. As if it'll open up, you know. It'll it work. Um, you know that what we think of as a G shape, except you know in those days it was a four four course instrument, so it's one finger. That was a C, and then when the guitar dropped from from being you know pitch to A to pitch to E, and then they added the extra string. You, you know, if you look at the, the alphabeto system that they had in the Baroque era, where people would learn how to play from, from chord shapes that were given letters of the alphabet, but it was really weird because like a G was the letter A, a C was the letter B, a D was the letter C, because you learned, that was the sequence that you learned your chord shapes in. Right. But the fact is that the G shape was kind of the first thing you'd learn, which makes sense because if you learn, if your first chord is a C, your four chord is an F, which immediately ties you up in knots if you're a beginner. Um, right. Because you've got to at least do a, you know, a partial bar, if not a full bar. Yes, yes. Um, but, but the thing about it is that standard tuning is, is essentially triadic. You've got a G triad there, you have an E minor triad there just on the open strings. And that was, you know, back in the Renaissance, a C triad, an A minor triad. Um, so the essence of the guitar really is its ability to play triads and play, you know, primary chords with simple shapes. And then with some, you know, a little advancement, being able to add a major seventh to an F chord or, or whatever, you know, a seventh, seventh chords, you know. Um, and then, of course, you know, we get into our, you know, into the 20th century where you know, 13th became, you know, de rigueur, as it was. Yes. Um, it is but, but, and, and Dagad doesn't lend itself to thinking in that way. The Dagad is more, in, in a sense, it's more pianistic than it is, um, than it is, 
like guitaristic because you can do things in Dagad of other tune. Here's an example. Um, you, you take Dagad and you shove the bottom strings down another whole step. So you have C. Double check tuning here. You have C. Cad Cad. C C G. Oh, I can't. I can't pronounce that. Nobody can pronounce that. That it's it's C G D G A D. Now there's there's your G. In this tuning, you avoid having to you know stretch out for the for the G uh, uh, in Dagad. Where so now your bottom strings are C. So there's C major, G major. So you know things like. an E minor 9, E flat major 9, um, stuff like that, C minor, very noir, you know, it's my tune guitar noir, um, but, it, but even B flat. There's a pianistic voicing. You know, the fact that you could do a C minor nine. I love this one. What a cool chord, you know. That's uh, that's the, all that the studies with Nadia Boulanger in uh, in Paris for Bert Bacharach. I think just you know. It's it's Ravel and uh, Ravel and and uh, Pano Chocolat kind of thing. <laughs> Definitely Ravel in all of your playing. But one thing I'd, one, sorry, one thing I'd like you. No, I'm not. Uh, one thing I'd love you to do is another another aspect of your acoustic guitar playing, which is just uh, super delicious, is your rhythmic thing. I mean, you use the guitar as a percussion instrument in some of your in some of your uh, arrangements, and they're just amazing and funky. And I'd love you to lay one of your rhythm arrangement things on where you know, and where I think you use the guitar as a percussion. You, you, Stuff like that. That's open G minor. That's uh, D G D G B flat D. Yeah. Choose any any tune that you like to, to play to to show all of the rhythmic stuff because I think that's fun. Yeah. Well, off the top of my head, I mean, it's it's kind of. I don't know. Do I have tunes that are specifically rhythmic driven, or are, is it's just kind of part of the texture? Well, any tune that you do it in, it's just. Also, I wanted you to explain to guitar players how you hit the guitar because you can't just hit the guitar you you must have figured out a technique to do it so that you don't break anything yeah i mean it's it's a drum you know um uh let's see i've got on let me just uh, hang on let me grab the dad gap one um the on um, tune of mine called White Pass Trail, um, where you know, it's that kind of thing. Um, now, if you really want, you know, the guy that plays drums on the guitar, you want Tommy Emmanuel, you know, because he'll pick up brushes and, you know. Um, and he's because he's a drummer, he, you know, he's a drummer as well as a guitar player. For me, it, it's just it's just part of the texture. It's like, what am I trying to illustrate with this? And that particular thing was just the image of these guys um, cutting a path, cutting a trail through canyons in Alaska and, you know, heavy you know, Victorian era machinery, kind of that sound. Um, that was part of the, the kind of the vision for the composition. Um, but I do use a lot of, you know, a lot of harmonic slaps where you just, you know, you do, you kind of bounce off the string 12 frets higher than your fingering. 
Um, yeah, I, I must say one of the, your techniques that I've always loved that I, I've never heard anybody do in such detail is your ability to play chords in harmonics. <laughs> well, I, that, I just stole that from, from uh, Bonnie Kessel. The, the idea of being able to, to kind of do the rake and have the... But the accuracy of it, I mean, if I try to do that, 20 times out of one, I would I would get it wrong. But you, you seem to get it right every time. It's How practice. do you visualize where it is going to be on the guitar to do it's the right? It's just practice. That's what it is. I mean, yeah, you just, you know, it's like this stuff is, it's it practicing things over and over. But, but to the point where I don't have to think about it. Right, of course. It's, of course. You know, it's like, and that's the thing about improvising in Dagad that has been a long-term project for me is getting to the point where I don't really have to think too hard about what's actually going on to be able to improvise. You know, it's one thing in a, you know, a rock context, you know, with something like Won't Get Fooled Again, where, you know, I'm a... Sure. Yeah. Stuff like that is one, but, you know... Stuff like that, Harold Arlen, where you know you got to kind of, kind of really get into where you know where the chord changes are, you know what, what's going on on the fingerboard, um, yes. and it you know it takes a lot of practice, it sure does. and it's you know it's part of a kind of a personal challenge to be able to take what I do onto that level. But you know, yesterday I did I did my my Facebook tea time with Larry Goldings. Loved it. And, you know, under those circumstances, I would not think about using Daggad because I know where Larry goes harmonically, and I don't want to have to think that hard. I don't want to have to think at all. I just want to, I, I, you know, I want to float on, on this bed of, of just way cool. Yeah, exactly, which Stop. is what you did, and it was really fun to listen to. It was a real treat yesterday to, to listen to that. Um, have have you got an idea of a piece that to close us out, which kind of incorporates all the stuff that you've been talking about, a little bit of this and a little bit of that? And, sure. Yeah, whatever you like. Well, here's uh, Cobalt Blue, which you know, which I'm in Dagat in D because I've got need those open strings. Let me double check tuning for and um, for me. That's kind of a signature, become a bit of a signature tune. Mm. But it has some of the, uh, some of the, you know, the slap and tickle. And the... I always liked it when you do that. So, Settle down, come on. But uh, just in passing, you know, that my evolution of fingerstyle guitar book really kind of goes through the renaissance and the baroque some loop music in there some what we call classical i mean giuliani like moro giuliani no relation to to rudy um well maybe he is i don't know but um but giuliani being one of the kind of founding fathers of classical was really just a fingerstyle guitar player in his own era you know played standing up played with uh, in ensembles with with piano and flute, guitar strap, huh? violin. Yeah, he had a guitar strap, yeah. You know, and you think about, I mean, playing upright as opposed to sitting down is a different kind of presentation. And especially in an era when there was no amplification. Okay. Cobalt Blue.
yeah, baby. There you go. Fantastic. Blue, blue, blue. Well, uh, Lawrence, it's been fantastic for you to be on Radio Richard, uh, my my first uh, podcast of the Radio Richard new series of stuff. Well, and, thanks for having me. And, well, I, I, we'll, we'll leave that alone. But <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, what I'd like to do as a special bonus for our mm-hmm. listeners is I'm going to play them um, something from Standard Time because uh, oh, I want also want to show you your incredible electric playing and it's just a marvel still to listen to you playing on this of course it's stormy weather so can can you set us up with uh, how it all came about and and the session and stuff like that well paul mccartney um as a music publisher um this would have been in 79 after wings had done the back to the egg album and over the summer he said you know do you want to do some stuff you know, do some covers of tunes in my publishing catalog. He was kind of assigning different you know, different artists to do stuff. And I said, sure. And I had done a couple of tunes. I did After You've Gone and Autumn Leaves um, with Paul Hart. And I realized that I really needed a producer, which is when I came to you, because you and I had uh, worked extensively together. And we sat down and went through a bunch of potential tunes. And then you did this glorious arrangement of Stormy Weather, which we recorded at Air Studios. And we had like 40 pieces, I think, something like that. It was more than that. It was more than that. More? Yeah. I think it's yeah. more, it was more like 60, I think. Okay, well, um, and David Katz was the contractor. I know. And we had one three-hour session. And this was not an easy arrangement no. by any means. And so we had done a few takes and the clock, you know, is ticking to the, you know, the three hour mark. And Chris Lawrence was playing bass. Yes. Wonderful bass player. And we didn't have drums, we had percussion. So it was kind of orchestra with, you know, kind of it, a built in rhythm section, but without stepping outside of the. Louis Jardim uh, on percussion. What's that? Was Louis Jardim on percussion? Oh, is that who it was? I, yeah, I didn't didn't remember that. But um, we we had one take left on the clock, and somehow when we when the, we came back into the tune at the end, Chris Lawrence just took off and did this amazing bass part that's just kind of playing across the beat. You know, a very daring thing to do when it was like, you know, the last take of the day. Yeah, I yeah. just kind of got to float on top of that. And yeah. I'll, I, I'll never remember, I'll never forget because we finished it at the, the nanosecond that the last note died away. David Katz stood up and said, OK, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and another interesting thing for the listeners is to understand we were in a very large studio at Air Studios, a very large room. And... Uh, you were in a booth with your with with the well, amp. my amp was in the booth i was standing outside he, yeah he was out that's right he was out with with the musicians playing a 335 i believe yeah. Is that right yeah, yeah. And, and but his, his amp was in a booth so that he could do that and the thing that always amazes me when i listen to it now is how unified and how it i mean of course it sounds like you're just floating on a bed of, of, of craziness, but it, but very, very relaxed. And, and, and the way that you played in a totally bluesy way against this kind of Gershwin on, on various <laughs> illegal drugs uh, kind of uh, harmonic basis that I've given you, it's just, it's just killing me. Oh, thank you. When, when we first ran the thing down, my, my favorite part of the whole session was on the, on the tapes afterwards, we could hear uh, I remember we were in the studio with, with engineer Mike Stavro. Uh, just be, just after we'd finished running down the first take, one of the guys in the string section said, "He's got to be kidding." <laughs> so, funny. listeners, uh, you make your own decision. <laughs> but remember who the second engineer was? Yes, um, I do. Renata. Yes, Renata. Renata, and who did Renata marry? Renata married Elton John. That's right. A famous yeah. marriage, yes. And she was great. She was, she was the, great. They, yeah. they were both terrific to work with and lots of fun in the studio. And we had some all night mixing sessions, I recall, because yeah. I was busy 
I was rehearsing with Wings during the day and then running over to our studio for, for mixing. Yeah, I know. It was really, it was, those were fun days. Yeah. And uh, so, so Lawrence, again, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, oh, my pleasure. I love every finger you have on your, on your uh, ha hands there, all of them. Ten so, fingers, they never leave my hands. <laughs> Great. And, uh, and I'll leave you all listeners with uh, this uh, silly version of Stormy Weather, which was lots of fun to do. Thank you.